You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. I was sitting on this cruise ship with my boyfriend having a cocktail before I was going to perform in a show that night and I was running a successful side business as a life coach and I went, wow, this is what I thought it would take me until 30. Like that was my kind of like before 30 bucket list. And I, I just went, all right, so, you know, what am I going to do now? What's the next, you know, I'm 20 at this point in time. Like what's the next thing for me if I've created all of this by 20? Like obviously I can create things faster than I think I can. My guest today is Rebecca Hulse. She's a speaker, a consultant, and business coach who revels in shaking up the realities and limiting paradigms of her clients. She's the regional coordinator of the Asia Pacific Region for Access Consciousness, which is an international company with reach into 174 countries. She's a certified joy of business facilitator. Having completed her first bucket list by age 20, Rebecca is the personification of the motto, impossible is temporary. She has experienced firsthand the power of opportunity, and she strives to constantly push the boundaries of what she's capable of, both personally and professionally. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Hi. Thank you, Sandy. It's, it's nice to be here. Yeah. So under 20, and now you're, you're 27, right? 27, yes old lady so (laughs) (laughs) feels like it today (laughs) (laughs) so I I just am so impressed by what you've accomplished this far I think at 27 I was kind of throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and trying to see what what stuck and um, looking for a husband I got married at 28 and um was married for 23 years and wow. didn't, didn't know what I was doing there either. So <laughs> I admire your focus. And I always like to start with what does a woman of value mean to you? So can you answer that question? Sure. So a woman of, of value means to me the ability to, to see and acknowledge what you're actually creating, what you're actually being in the world. Like, you know, we talk about that each person is unique and that they have their own thing that is special about them. But if you don't explore that or spend a bit of time actually looking and seeing what it is that you actually be that's different, what you think that's different, what you do that is going about things in a different way to other people, then you never really get to see that for yourself. It just becomes something wonderful and pleasant about you that other people often say, oh, that's so great about Rebecca, or that's so great about Sandy, but you never really get to get that for yourself. And so for me, it's the self-exploration of noticing, huh, okay, I do have a different point of view here. What if that's a great thing? Oh, I do do things a little bit quicker in this area, or I'm a bit aggressive, or I'm a bit you know, weird. And okay, what if that's actually a great thing? So for me, it's about finding that difference that you are and then acknowledging that is something that is actually wonderful about you. I love that definition. Nobody's, nobody's shared that one yet. Okay. And uh, yeah, two points for Rebecca. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting because in my other career as a dating and relationship coach, we always look for what's unique in a person so they can bring that to partnership. And people get very stuck in that area. They say, I don't know what's unique about me. I don't even know what I'd like about me. So how do you help people who really can't even go there? I, I ask them to start to look at something that they're good at or that's fun for them. Like at least one, people have at least one thing that they know that they're good at. Maybe they're a great parent or maybe they are really good at their job, or they have ease with juggling multiple different things. Like everyone, or they're a really great friend, and they're always there for people. Like people know, like they're willing to see that they have at least one good thing about them. And once you start, like you just peek in that door. Once you just start opening that door, then eventually it will come out and you will start to see that there's actually many different things that are actually great about you but you just have to like just open that door a tiny bit and get your foot in there and then you'll be able to start this journey interesting yeah 
one small step so we don't have to do yeah. it all at once. Yeah, I baby like steps, that. please. Yeah, like, baby no steps. Long life leap, you know, life threatening leaps. Like we don't have time for that. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of people really look at the overwhelm of, I can't do it because there's too many steps or yeah. that's too big. Like I, I'm not unique enough because I have to be the next president. You know, I have to be the CEO of the company and they can't see like, oh, I'm a, I'm a great friend. And I think also yeah. a lot of times um, it helps to see yourself through the eyes of someone else. You know, like what would your friends yeah. say about you? What would a child say about you? And sometimes through that, it's easier for us to see ourselves. It is. And yeah, it, it definitely can be, but it, it is a very tricky path. Like, you know, one of the things that I often say in my classes is every time you're looking for outside validation, that's something where you actually need to acknowledge it in yourself. It's actually a cry for you to actually acknowledge what's actually going on for you right now, because otherwise you're always basing your value off what someone else is saying about you instead of what you know to be true. Yeah, it's very important to be self-focused and not compare and despair and look at other yeah. people for validation. And we spend so much of our life in that space. And it's not very fun. No, it's not. And it's not very <laughs> empowering. And uh, it doesn't make us feel valued at all. Nope. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about where you're from um, and you know how you got to be where you are today. Sure. So I, I'm from New Zealand. I'm actually in my home for the first time in six weeks. Oh, wow. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I'm on tour a lot of the year. And so it's, it's really lovely to be home for the, the holiday period. Um, and my parents were always people that said like, look, you can, you can do anything that you want to do. You just have to figure it out and start heading in that direction. <laughs> will help you if you need, but you have to choose a path. And, and I did, I decided I wanted to become a professional dancer and they were all about that, but they also know me very well. And they sat me down and they said, Rebecca, how much does a dancer make? <laughs> and I went, I know I know not enough. And they said, that's absolutely fine, but you get that you're a bit of a princess. And, and I did, I have always been a little bit like that. And so I, they said, you know, that's okay, but what if you start a side business as well? And I said, yeah, 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 that's great, but I'll do it later. I'm so busy with my dance training right now. And, you know, I enrolled myself in like this beautiful Russian boot camp kind of style dance and very intensive dance training. And um, it eventually led me to move to a different city in New Zealand. And all of a sudden I found the training was so much easier because I've been at Russian boot camp and I can't sit still and I needed something to do. So I decided to start exploring the world of business and it led me to the tools of access consciousness through a, a wonderful book by my, my now friend, Stephen Bowman called no more business as usual. And it started to explore the kind of ways that I knew that business should be where it was about something that we now call, it sounds weird, but following the energy, which is the idea of, you know, you get a thought, you get an idea, you see that there's a possibility and you run with it. You don't necessarily have to analyze everything. You just go with the different movement or the choice that you see at the time that needs to happen. And so I started using these access consciousness tools and all of a sudden the whole life that I had desired and dreamed of just spilled out in front of me. And it got to this point that I was sitting on this cruise ship with my boyfriend having a cocktail before I was going to perform in a show that night. And I was running a successful side business as a life coach. And I went, wow, this is what I thought it would take me until 30. Like that was my kind of like before 30 bucket list. And I, I just went, all right, so, you know what am I going to do now? What's the next, you know, I'm 20 at this point in time. Like what's the next thing for me? If I've created all of this by 20, like obviously I can create things faster than I think I can. So what's next for me? And I just tumbled into this 
um, working with the company of Access Consciousness and expanding it and around the world and working with people all over the world to empower them to choose what they know that they should be able to create and actually going and doing it. And it's just been a wonderful adventure. Amazing. And I think, again, people hesitate. They don't believe that yes. they have what it takes or they, um, they don't follow through. Like you, you had your ideas and then you didn't overthink it. You just started following no. the trail. Well, it's not that I didn't overthink it, but I didn't <laughs> listen to my overthinking. Ah, okay. Um, you know, like I think we create this illusion around successful people that they never had it hard, that they never had moments of doubt, that they didn't feel like it was the end of the world sometimes. Like, oh no, we do. Like, <laughs> I am a serial overthinker. <laughs> I can, you know, I can, I can predict to you the end of the world in an instant. I can say, great, this is perfect. This is exactly how this is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, but I know that those strengths aren't important. That, that mindset, that destructive cycle, that's not where the real show is. And so I'm like, all right, cool. I'm having a moment. Let's just, you know, indulge in this. Let's get it out of our system. And then I can focus on what's really important because I think it's so important not to paint an illusion of these people that have done something that you think is great because, you know, they're just people. I really am just a person that has managed to fill in a lot of things in a very short amount of time because I was lucky enough to get the tools of not needing to listen to all the limiting beliefs that I had in my world just to go, all right, cool. I have those, but that doesn't have to run my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for defining that because <laughs> I think people do need to see that we are all just people. Yeah. And I think the difference between what makes a person a success and what doesn't is which, which voice you listen to and which, really? which runs the ship. Right. So <laughs> um, I like how you described that you hear it and you can indulge in it, but you don't let it ruin you and you don't let it be the yeah. voice that guides you then I, I don't think everybody knows the difference and um so so how like walk us through that like so let's say somebody gets a limiting belief you know i i can't that yeah. there's no way so what what would be the process somebody would go through oh. to I think it's also important this is where you know we talk about knowing yourself earlier for me I can be very serious or very humorous. There's not much in between. Um, it's either one or the other. And so if I notice myself becoming dramatic, becoming very serious, very pessimistic, I will go, okay, Rebecca, you're right. You absolutely should not do anything. Why don't you know, there's carpet right there. It's very comfortable. Let's just lie down on it and give up. You're going to be fine. It's perfectly safe there on the carpet. I'm indulging in myself lying there on the carpet and then, you know, that kind of infuriates me because I'm like, no, I am not a pathetic woman. I can do this. And so the whole idea of indulging in a pathetic or a limiting situation is often what will snap you out of it because you realize, actually, I don't want to be like that. That's crap. I really am not interested in that kind of life. And so for me, painting something as more ridiculous, more limiting, more pathetic, more sad, more traumatic, indulging in that for me, then makes me go, actually, that's way too much drama. I'm over it. I'm out. I'm done. Now let's get back to what we were trying to do in the first place. Mm. Yeah, that's a good tool. I, I learned something similar in coaching school where uh, you would just take people to the next step each time they would say, um, like I had a client once who was starting a new business and he said, uh, he had this fear that he was going to fail. So we took him through all the steps of failure. Um, so what would happen if your business failed? Well, I would lose all my money. Okay. And then what? And then what? And he got to the point of, and then I'll be homeless. And then he just burst out laughing and he said, I'm not going to let myself get homeless. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah. the problem I think for a lot of people is that they stop themselves and they just live in that space of this yeah. nebulous fear. And it's like, well, but, but what is it? Um, so unpacking the fear and taking all the layers off is very helpful. And it's like, I love the over dramatizing yeah. and exactly. you know, it's just, it can be ridiculous and, it, and you see how silly it is. 
And I mean, the other part of this too is like, you really do get to choose how you live your life. Like there's no one policing how you live your life. There's no one saying what kind of thoughts are okay for you to have in your head. Like we live in a wonderful age and time where anything is truly possible. Like you can design any kind of life. You can live in a van, you can live in a castle, you can live in an apartment, you can live on the beach. Like you can choose every single part of your life. And so, you know, for a lot of us, we feel, and I say feel in a more uh, intonated sense, safer when there's things we can't do. We feel better when we put ourselves in this very safe but compact place where we don't reach out. We don't go for the unknown. And I would like to present the question of, is that really enough for you to stay there? Or do you know that there's more possible that you want to reach for, even though it's unknown, even though it's scary, even though you can't control it? God forbid, I am one of the hugest control freaks out there. <laughs> but I know that life is much better when it's beyond my control. Yeah, so how do you take things I truly know. Right, so, so you're a self-admitting uh, control freak. And, Absolutely. Hi, uh, my name's Rebecca Holt, I'm a control <laughs> freak. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think, you know, highly successful people do have these kinds of personalities often. Yes. And, um, but we also take risks. And yes. taking emotional risks is a huge part of growth. Yeah. Um, but I remember when I got divorced, which was a risk. Um, it was a, it was a leap into the unknown. And I personally, the thought of being stuck is so much worse than the thought of the unknown. Yeah. So being stuck with like being in quicksand for me was always my motivation of like, just get out. I don't care where I'm going. I'll figure it out. Yeah. But a lot of people would rather stay stuck, would rather stay in horrible relationships and so many people gave me terrible advice, uh, which I didn't ask for. Um, and they would tell me things like, oh, you know, my relationship's horrible, but here's what I do. I just kind of live a separate life. And I'm like, okay, but that's not me. And, um, and good for you and do whatever makes you happy, but that's not me. And so, so for those other control freaks out there who are saying, but I want to control everything, how do you give it up to faith? How do you take that leap? Well, I kind of worked a way around it um, because I don't totally want to give up control, but I am also willing to realize that I can't control everything because no one gave me the position of God. <laughs> you know, they didn't hire me for that yet. I'm kidding. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I actually asked, you know, we have this wonderful work of access consciousness, and I believe you've had some other people on, on the show that also work with these tools. And I asked questions to the founder of Access Consciousness, Gary Douglas, about control because I know he's a control freak too, but he doesn't let that ruin his life and make everything smaller. And he, what he said was you can either control the outcome or you can control to create a greater possibility. And for me, that just made so much more sense of like, ah, I, there's still some kind of capacity here. Like the ability to have so many things going and have like a bit of a radar on every single thing, like that is a capacity of control. But when you're going, no, mine must be like this, must be under control, must be in this particular way in order for it to work. That's a limiting version of control. And so instead I just kind of like, let it out there, let it go and go like, all right, cool. What if I control, control this to create a greater possibility? What if I instead don't have to control everything to try and create a perfect outcome because it's never going to be perfect. God damn it. I wish it could. <laughs> it's never going to. Um, but what if I could just make it greater than it was before? Yeah. And that's been like a really good outlet for me and for my control and for my creativity to be able to go, all right, not going to be perfect, but what if I can make it greater? Interesting. So I think there's a lot there to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, and again, I'll, I'll make the parallel to the relationship world. A lot of people want to control the outcome. They don't Absolutely. even want to go on a date because what if it fails? What if they, you know, what if they get hurt? 
And, and the scary thing, what if it's actually good? And then, oh yeah. crap, now you have someone that you've been asking for that you don't even know if you want. Yeah, be careful what you wish for, right? So either way, it's like you have to face the reality of it. But yeah. the, the, the way that you're looking at the world is not only healthier, but it does open up to magic. Like there's a yeah. sense of, I don't know yet what is going to be revealed. And so when, when you realize that you can't control the outcome and, and it's not good to control the outcome because then you could probably miss it actually happening. Yeah. And I find that in the relationship world where people meet amazing people, but they have this vision that it has to be this way and has to look this way and has to happen this way. And has to, yes, the lists <laughs> that are really long and ridiculous and have nothing to do with character and, a good match and it's the same in business and it's the same in everything and I know that like when I created this business and I, I got divorced and I started as a life coach became certified I didn't know how I was going to make a living when I got divorced and I have friends who are like I can't get divorced I don't have the finances for it and I you know if you want it badly enough you're going to find the finances yes. and it it happened for me because I well, I had several jobs before I focused only on this because I had a family and a house and a lot of things to take care of. But I had a vision and I knew where I was going. I just didn't know how I'd get there. Uh, but I never thought in scarcity. I never thought yeah. I can't do this. And I didn't want to be a statistic. I didn't want to be like so many people who had started yeah. life coaching and gave up because it wasn't an overnight success. And so I think if you maintain Can we that, just say no business is an overnight success. No, like, it's not unless it's yeah. some crazy fluke and often that crashes and burns because the person doesn't know what to do with their success. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, opening to the, to how it's going to look, not, not having that stuck vision of yeah. it has to be this way is such an important distinction. Yeah, because I mean, it, it breaks down to, you know, what something is like in reality. I mean, like, I was watching this comedy special last night, and, you know, she talked about how, you know, girls, all girls have dated at least one guy in their lifetime that is really not that attractive, but just makes you laugh and you love who you are around him. And it's that same thing of like, what if it's not defined by, the the perfect image because you know we live in an extremely image-based society but what that takes away is the entire energy the magic as you were talking about of what can actually be behind things like every single interaction you have with a person has a, a possibility for engaging in a completely different contribution like your conversation with them your energy their energy what you talk about just how relaxed you feel around them. Like all of that can create something that's really cool and different. And then none of that is based on looks. No. None of that is based on the list. So true. And I love talking to strangers for that reason. I, I was just <laughs> traveling from Israel to uh, back home. My daughter lives in Israel and nice. on the plane, there was uh, this guy sits down next to me and right away his energy was great. He's 26 years old, uh, said hi very friendly. There are some people who sit down and they're like closed off. Right. <laughs> so he was open. He had a book um, that was a self-help book about negotiation skills. And already I liked him. And, <laughs> and we just started talking and he's engaged and he's working on his relationship with this woman. And he told me how it's, how it's ebbed and flowed. And, um, and that we just had an incredible conversation. It was like two o'clock in the morning. And I said, I think we need to sleep. <laughs> but I, I just, nothing would have happened if we both didn't start talking. Yeah. And I've been thinking about him since last Friday when I met him um, because he added to my life and I added to his life. And yeah. it wouldn't have happened if we didn't create that moment. And so we, d we don't realize what value we can bring to people. Um, I think yeah. that's another thing. It's like going back to the beginning of this conversation where people don't realize how unique they are and what they have, what value they can add. Yeah. Um, but yeah. also, I mean, like what you said just now with the, the guy on the plane, like you created that moment. That moment didn't happen. And 
I think that's one of the biggest illusions that we have is that things happen to us. You know, like truly, like you can't sit on a plane and be closed off and have your energy all to yourself and expect a wonderful conversation like that to happen yeah. without a lot of force on the other person's behalf. And if they're putting that much force into having a conversation with you, I'm not sure that's going to be that fun anyway. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's, you know, once we start to realize that what we create matters, then you, you're actually the one that's in charge of your life and, and what occurs in it, then you have a completely different perspective on what is going on in your life. And so, you know, when we were talking about fear earlier and, you know, what would happen if you failed at your business, if you failed at anything, if you realize that you're the person that gets to create this, you're actually the source for what goes on in your life. Then if you lost everything, would you really lose it or would you still have you? Yeah. And from there, you can, you know, like that guy was like, oh, I would never let myself get homeless. Yeah, because he knows that he's the source for creating his life and he's not going to let that happen. We yeah. all have things that are non-negotiable for us that we're not willing to let happen. And so what if you started to explore what that was for you and then you just took that first step? It doesn't need to be a gigantic earth shattering leap. But you just take a step in the right direction and then another one and then eventually it will start to snowball into a way that you can't not live the life that you've always desired true and for control freak when you know that you can control those aspects of yes. your life it's uh it's very empowering yeah and it's much harder to control things when you're running at a dead sprint than it is when you're you know like wondering if you're going to take the first step like, that's why, like, I just, um, I try to empower everyone to take, like, what's another step and another step and another step, because four steps into something, it's much harder to turn back and go, actually, no, this isn't working out perfectly, so I'm going to quit. It's much harder to hear at step four than it is before you've even taken the first step. And it's so like, true. you know, what if you take four steps before you judge yourself about what you're creating? Yeah. I'm working on an online course with a woman who's a therapist, and She's never done anything like this before. She's always traded dollars for hours and she lived mm -hmm. in this place of scarcity. Like, where's my money going to come from? And I said, well, let's expand how you're reaching people. And it was all so overwhelming. So she would tell me, I'm freaking out, but I'm loving it. And so <laughs> um, we're about to launch in February and it's so exciting. And That's so cool. Yeah. But you see like, you know, this is all strange. It's all yeah. new. But it's, it's exciting to take those steps because it transforms you and it transforms how you reach people and, and it shows you what else is inside you because if you're just doing one thing all the time, you don't know what other skills you have and how else you can interact with people. Exactly. So share with us um, some of the ways that you work. I know you help people bring more joy to business, but if you could share a little bit more about that and then I'd love to hear... Um, a client story, like a, a success story? Sure. So Joy of Business is one of the specialties of Access Consciousness. So Access Consciousness is a worldwide movement that is basically using a very set of dynamic energy changing tools on any area of your life. And Joy of Business is all about creating the business of your life and also physical businesses. Because um, Simone Millis is the founder of this particular um, specialty uh, has the point of view that, you know, if you've got blood running in your veins, like you woke up, there's blood in your veins, you're in business <laughs> because you're in the business of your life. And she would like to see everyone look at themselves as the CEO of your own life. And, you know, if you were in that leadership position, who would you fire from your life? Who would like, who or what would you fire? Who would you hire? What other things would you add to it? Like how's the business of your life running. You want a profit level of joy and happiness and success and wonder and magic, or are you in a bit of a deficit of, of you know, of boredom, of sadness, depression, you know, where are you actually at in, on your balance sheet? And so we talk about this in becoming a leader. And then we also move into the physical business sector of maybe you want to start your first business. Maybe you're looking for a kickstart. Maybe you already have a business and it's getting to a point that you're like, I, I'm stuck. I don't know how to move forward in this. Or you're a solo entrepreneur and you want to branch out into a business that actually has staff. And how the hell do you work with other people? 
um, you know, that's a big conversation that we have. And it's one of the ones that I truly love and adore. Um, I have learned so much about leadership, about working with other people, about empowering them to truly come out and create what they know is possible. Because I actually just wrote an article yesterday about, you know, hiring millennials and what's important to them so that you can actually capitalize on those values instead of wondering, what do you do with this generation that is so different? Um, and we're talking about, you know, the desire for growth, the personal engagement and communication that they're looking for. And I don't think that this just applies to millennials. I think it applies to, you know, it's something that we've all been craving is more engagement with what you work with, with knowing that what you do contributes, with being able to grow and be greater than what you were before. And these are all core tools in joy of business. And then the weird thing is, we want to encourage you to have fun in what you do. <laughs> um, you know, Dane here, the co-founder of Access Consciousness said, money follows joy, joy does not follow money. And this is a key part of what we're creating in Joy of Business, where we're actually looking at, okay, this is great, and this may be successful in this reality, but is it bringing you any joy? Because the minute the joy stops, the money eventually will dry up, you know, because your energy is not exuberant, is not fulfilled, is not involved in creating this anymore. You know, when things start to not be fun anymore, eventually, like, you crawl up and, you know, get crusty around the edges and, and go into yourself rather than having an outward reach in the world. Like, when you're happy, you're willing to be expressive, to be a contribution. When you're not happy, you, we tend to become more self-involved. We want to cocoon. We want to go away from the world. And so with this, when you're happy, you can create more. Sounds simple. So, yeah, it sounds simple, and I know that there are going to be people listening who say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." They're all the skeptics. Um, Absolutely, you can be skeptic. Yeah. Well, I of will course. say, I know a lot of people who make a lot of money and are miserable. Um, I don't think they're creators. I, I remember years ago, I had a friend whose husband had a nervous breakdown. He ended up yeah. in the hospital because he was so stressed out with his job. And he went right back because the money was really good. He had a high paying job. He worked crazy hours. I know another woman had gallbladder surgery because she was so stressed out. She goes, Oh my God, I'm leaving this business. I know it's like, she was a client of mine at the time. And she goes, this was my wake up call. And then the fear of what would it be like if I didn't have this income brought her right back. Um, she finally had the courage to leave her husband just recently, but it took her like 20 years. So a but lot of people live in that. You have to your own pace. Right. And, you know, for some people, working in a job like that, it works for them. And so, you know, this is one of the things that we start to look at in Access Consciousness. It's a really unorthodox way of doing things is truly looking at what works for you. Like some people love being unhappy. I had a grandmother. She had her greatest joy in being mean to everyone. Like that's what brought her joy. And yeah. you know, there's, there's all types of people in this world <laughs> and it's totally okay. But yeah. you have to know what works for you. That's if true. having money from this kind of job works for you, then that's fine. And what else can you do so that you have a little bit more sanity and ease with it? So your mm -hmm. body isn't breaking down, you know? So, you know, if, it's not necessarily about like you have to you have to leave everything and start your own business and be happy that way. Like that's not what we're saying in Joy of Business. What we want you to look at is, is this working for you? If so, great. What else can you add? If this is not working for you, then what do you need to change so that it does? Right. Because we don't have a point of view that there's any set way to do things, that there's any right way, that there's any wrong way. We just want you to have a look at it and see, is this actually working for you or is there something different that you get would be greater for you? And what is that? Take yourself yeah. into a place that you would normally not go to or that you would normally be with someone like a coffee shop, like, like lunch, you know, or make yourself something beautiful and sit there and maybe you have a journal and maybe you just think about it and you go, all right, so how is this going? Yeah. How yeah. am I with all of this? 
what's happening here? You know, what's up, doc? <laughs> and just really sit with yourself, which most exactly. people never do. They're on their phones. It's terrifying. And I yes. get it. Like it's yes. a horrible conversation at first, but I promise you it gets better and it yeah. gets easier. And you may even enjoy the conversation that you have with yourself. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, times have changed a lot since I was a kid. <laughs> And we spent so much time with ourselves and so yeah. much time outside and we didn't have devices. We didn't have, you know, all the screens and the, the distractions. And it was a very different way to grow up. And today it's much more challenging and, and we have incredible tools so you can look at it either way. And it's, yeah. you know, sort of similar to what we're talking about. Like I have a lot of Facebook groups that support the work that I do. And a lot of women will say to me, I'm not on Facebook. It's too much of a distraction. And I don't want to see people's posts about their cats and their babies. And <laughs> um, so I said, you can control Facebook. Like you don't have to see all those posts. And you yeah. can control what is in your newsfeed. And you can control what you respond to. And, um, it, you know, you can join Facebook just for this group and not even be visible anywhere else. You know, it's yeah. really up to you to decide how you want to deal with all the distractions and all the social media. So how do you deal with it? You're, you're a busy woman. Yes. <laughs> you're a well, I, well, first I noticed that I'm like, if I ever go into overwhelm, I'm like, all right, cool. Is there anything truly that I could not handle? And once I get back to you, no, there's not. So what are you going to, how are you going to handle this? Then I'm much better because I know that for me, when things slow down, it's actually more when I get overwhelmed. Whereas if I have lots of different things on, then I'm good. I pick up the pace. I have enough balls rolling that, you know, it's that snowball effect again. It's much easier when I'm running downhill than when I'm having to like carry four things at once and go for a walk. So for me, I know that what works for me is to have multiple things going on. And so then I, I just look to the future and I'm like, right, 2020 is around the corner. So what different projects are we working on? Like we have a, you know, a 1200 live, you know, person live class happening in Sao Paulo, Brazil coming up next year. And so I've put a lot of my attention on that. You know, it's going to be one of our biggest classes of the year. So I've put a lot of my energy into that one, which is helping with the snowball of like, you know, making sure that it's about keeping moving rather than getting stuck. Um, but I get it. Like I go on Facebook, you know, sometimes my phone in the morning, like a thousand WhatsApp messages, you know, different things on Facebook, Instagram. And so I take a breath and I'm like, all right, is there any of this that I truly need to handle? And I just go with that. Or is there any of this that would bring me joy to look at? And then I will, I will just scroll through and then I will pick one or two things. And I'll look at those and, and I'll respond to those. But I don't buy into that I have to see everything, that I have to look at everything. Um, and Aaron thought I had yesterday was, oh, it's Christmas engagement time soon. Um, I love making a joke of that. You know, people can't think of anything better to, to get for Christmas so they get engaged. Because, <laughs> um, you know, I'm that age group now and, and I'm not interested in, in having a relationship um, yet because I'm, you know, I'm too busy doing this and having so much fun doing it. But it's very funny to me to see like, oh, there's all these people that are about to get engaged. And so <laughs> I'm just like, I'm ready. You're ready, ready for, for it. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just those thoughts that you see. And, you know, the reality of Facebook and social media is that people are going to share their lives. They're going to share their thoughts, their opinions. That's what it's there for. But you don't have to take that on as yours. And, you know, what if you can, you know, just have something that's more interested, less involved when you're looking at social media, like social media isn't your life. You're living your life. And then, you know, you choose to express some of that on social media. Some share more, some share less. Um, I recently went to China, which is a bit of a breathtaking uh, break on a lot of the different communication platforms that we have. Um, and because of that, there's energetically a little bit more space. Not necessarily if you are a resident of China because you have your own social media platforms, but if you're, you know, let's say a Westerner in China, then you're going to have a little bit of an energetic break. 
from social media. So I was just there for five days and I was like, huh, if I never need a break, I'm going to come to China <laughs> <laughs> and not use my VPN and, and just like truly be unavailable. Yeah. But it wasn't really about needing that, but it was just about the energetic space that was there because you're a little bit detached from the Western world there. And so, you know, for me, I ask questions like, okay, is there anything I truly need to handle here? Is there something that would bring me joy to look at right now? And all right, what if I just marked all of this as red? I'm totally willing to do that and miss out on whatever happens. You know, I'm sure someone will tell me the news if it's really important. Yeah, I always say that. The news, the news will get through no matter what. Yes. Hear it on, I never listen to news on the TV. I don't have a TV anymore um, because I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want it to infiltrate me. Yeah. But if it's important, it gets through. And I think what you said is really important in that you have to prioritize. And many people don't know how. And I think that is, again, one of the signs of success is... You have to practice. Right. Like, truly. Yeah. You just have to start asking yourself questions like, okay, is all of this important right now or is one of this? Yeah. Um, I actually had the, the privilege of, of talking to one of my friends that's been a mentor for me for many years in, in this job. And he was having a moment of overwhelm and saying like, oh my God, everything's so crazy. And I was like, well, I believe someone had a conversation with me about if this is really important or is everyone just crying wolf? And <laughs> it was very fun to be able to have the same conversation that he right. had with me with him and for him to go, hmm. Okay, you're actually yeah. right here. Yeah, <laughs> my kids will do that to me. Mom, yes. uh, you're not practicing what you preach there. <laughs> kids are like the doormen of the building where they see and hear everything. And, totally. um, you know, I'm being watched. And they watched. never let you get away with anything. <laughs> no, which is good. I actually appreciate it. They're honest. Um, so uh, I had asked for a client success story. I would love to yes. hear so I, I heard about this one recently. I had a, a wonderful now friend of mine in New York who went to one of my business done different classes, which is a three-day masterclass we have with Joy of Business. And she was very new to the tools of Joy of Business and she had many, many questions. And, you know, we sat there with each one of them and we went through them and I had her back and she got to change some things that were really going on for her. She has a, a jewelry business that is a beautiful line of a very different jewelry, but working with fine materials, silver, gold, gemstones, but in a very raw way. And I didn't know this at the time, but she had not been able to pick up a pencil and sketch a design in six months. Like she just, she couldn't bring herself to do it. And, you know, we did this class and we see what changed. And then she actually came to my next class in New York, which is about eight weeks later. And she said, Rebecca, I never told you. I've been sketching. I have so many designs. Like she had like six to 10 finished pieces that she wow. made. And she hadn't been able to even pick up a pencil to sketch in the last six months beforehand because of the joy of business tools. And it was just one of those things of like, you know, we get so trapped in our mindset of what we think we can or can't do that it stems our creativity so much to the point that it can almost dry up. And so, so to see her like be unleashed on the world again was, I think, one of the biggest gifts of this class. And we see it time and time again of now these people like it's almost like you can't stop creating. Wow. And for me, that's so powerful because you know there's so many of us that have such a great capacity at something that should really be out there in the world just spreading forth with abandon and to see her going from you know not even being able to do what she is already great at to not being able to stop herself doing what she's great at to me that's what I would like to see with every single person that attends a joy of business class or uses one of these tools or books a session with the joy of business facilitator Beautiful. You unleashed her. <laughs> <laughs> she unleashed herself. I just asked her some questions and facilitation to get her to that place. She still yeah. had to do the work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a co-active process. It is. Um, so you mentioned what's going on in the future for 2020. You have this, this big conference um, class. Is it a class conference? Yes, yes. Yes, that's an access consciousness one that's called the foundation. Um, we have many classes and, and things that are coming up with 
with Joy of Business in 2020. I, I will actually be in New York in, at the end of January to facilitate another three-day masterclass with my wonderful friend, Francesca, who's actually the worldwide coordinator of Access Consciousness. We've actually been designing a planner so that you can have this energy of Joy of Business and these tools that can help spark and bring joy to you every day in your life every day. So we don't, we're not selling the 2019 one, don't worry. <laughs> we have a, a 2020 Joy of Business Planner that's actually been, been launched in English, French, German, Spanish, and Portuguese. Oh, cool. It's, it really helps. I, I have my clients journaling a lot and mm. um, because you know often we have so much going on in our head and we don't actually even yeah. sort it out. One of my clients is doing morning pages, which she wakes up every morning and does from the artist's way. She she is just right for like 20 minutes. And it's really opened up her whole creativity and ideas and thoughts for herself because she was sorting through. She was really at a crossroads in her life. I love working with her because we can create her future. Yeah. Um, so what else is your dream for your future? Well, I was... Talking to my mom, who's another incredible lady that also can succumb to boredom sometimes, and then <laughs> she, she never get my mom bored. You will destroy the world. Um, <laughs> is one of the things. So I was looking at her like, all right. So what do you want to do? Like we can choose anything. Like money's not an issue. Time's not an issue. Like we run our own businesses. We work from home and around the world. What do we want to do? And one of the projects that we have is actually we want to go to places that don't have business ed education, especially for women, and go go to those places like you know different villages in Africa is in the, as a place that's on our radar. And, you know, she wants to go to Cambodia, and actually teach women and you know anyone that's interested. We're not going to exclude men here either. The business education they need to be able to lead their community into the future. So. That's something that we're excited to be doing in April. If, and if anyone hears this and desires to be a contribution in some way, please reach out to me. I would love to, to have you join us. We have nothing official or set in stone yet, but <laughs> we're currently working on it. And I'm, I'm excited. I think it's going to make us very big, busy and very fulfilled. That sounds amazing. Um, and working with your mom, which is really yeah. cool. Most it's people can't do that. Yeah. It sounds like you really admire her. Yes. Well, she's, well she's had a lot to do with who I am today. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, and you mentioned that you're not in a relationship right now because you're focusing on work and doing all this amazing work. So for do now, you yeah. have a, yeah. So <laughs> what's your vision for a relationship? Uh, I think I would need to be with someone that would desire to create 20 times greater together than we do apart. Um, I actually have two wonderful friends that had a great relationship. They, and then they also uncreated their relationship. Um, I believe you might be talking to her soon, Simone Millicent. Yes, I, I had her. What? She was yes. on my other show and oh, okay. um, they had just split and just split. came on together. So yes. she's coming um, on by herself, coming oh, on nice. soon. Yeah. So I had the pleasure of helping them create their book, Relationship, ah. Are You Sure You Want One? And it, it truly inspired me to go, all right, I'm willing to have this be part of my future if it's something that not necessarily looks like Brendan and Simone's relationship, but, but looks like me and another person being able to create something to, greater together. Because, you know, I'm not interested in investing my time in something that is not making both of us happy and creative and generative and more than we were before. And so... I'm open to it. I don't know what it would look like or be like, but we shall see. Right. Maybe I'll come on your relationship podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> give you an update. It would be great. Um, but I, I think that's a great way to look at it. And I, I feel the same way. I, I didn't know who I was at your age, as I said, and I, I made some, some, I wouldn't call them mistakes, but I, it was the steps that I had to take at that time. And because of those those steps that I took, I became who I became. And I really became a dating and relationship coach because of my failed marriage and failed relationships and, and the lessons I learned and I wanted to do better. And I said, if I'm learning yeah. these skills, I want to teach them to other people. Because And I think it's, sorry to interrupt, but I, 
I see so many people that are like, they broke up. Why would I want to get relationship advice from them? And it's like, do you want to have, do you want to learn from someone that's just had one successful relationship and that's it? Like, I think you want to learn from something that has been through the trenches. They've yeah. done and been everything and, you know, made up, yeah. got back together, destroyed it, created it, <laughs> enjoyed it, hated it, loved it. Like, <laughs> You want to have someone that's gone and done some groundwork. Yeah, it's, and it's, again, people stay in that place of thinking and yeah. planning and reading about it and listening to a podcast. And, and you have to get into <laughs> about everything. No, it's, it's people do stay very stuck in that sense. Yes. And yeah. I believe like every person you meet is your teacher. Every, every step you take teaches you something if you're willing to look. And if you're willing to really listen to the lessons learned and, and then it becomes like this place of abundance instead of, Oh my God, you know, I might get yeah. hurt again. I have a and client. Maybe even fun. Maybe even <laughs> fun. <right? laughs> my life is really fun. I, I have never had so much fun and I, I never was so deliberate about my life until I started this new career. And I started another career a year ago and that's why I'm doing this podcast because I wanted to work with, more women in business and and work on their value because that's really where it all starts is who are you and how do you value yourself and that's what we bring to the world yeah um, it's up to you ladies it is watching this it is <laughs> um so it'll be interesting to see if you find that guy and and it's um it's important to know that you you want something that's going to create something bigger yeah i think you know I, somebody recently said to me, how are you a role model for your children if you're not in a relationship right now? And I was like, first of all, I think what I'm a fun question. I know, really. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you're a success? It was like a very confrontational question. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think I'm a great role model. Um, I'm teaching my kids not to compromise. I do get out there. I date. I give lots of people a chance. I have broadened who I date. But I also prioritize my work, and I want somebody who's going to add value to my life um, as I add value to theirs. And I don't want boring. I, I am a person <laughs> who also has lots of pots all the time. I mean, I could never do a job that just was one thing. You know, I always, yeah. as an artist, I, I was an artist before I became a coach, and I always loved Picasso because he had so many styles. He had the blue period. Don't box me. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't ever want to be boxed. In fact, like people said, choose a niche. And I was like, no, that's boxing me in. So I'm the same way. And I, I'm writing a book and I have two podcasts and I have two coaching businesses and workshops. So if you're the speaking. crazy lady listening to this wondering <laughs> if you should narrow down, if you should focus, don't worry. <laughs> Please don't worry. Like you've got this. Just keep all your balls rolling and keep them up in the air and push them forward and you'll get there. <laughs> and if a ball falls down, it didn't it wasn't meant to stay up. Like it made a glorious smash. Listen to the yes. crystal falling <laughs> and move on. <laughs> and I mean the truth is I do take a step back all the time and yeah. look at what's working and what's not because sometimes I feel like I am spinning my wheels and I used to write a ton for publications and I don't do that anymore because I don't want to. I it's not a good use of my time. I'd rather write course material and deliver a new course. Um, so, let's ask you a few questions. And uh, this is the lightning round. And okay. I would this is love exciting. to. Hear I love doing this to other people. Like um, when we have the Joy of Business Radio Show, and we're always like, "Come on, lightning questions." Okay, so good. It's fun to be asked them. <laughs> good. You're on the other side now. So, Rebecca, fill in the blank. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. Composed. Ah. Like composed enough. What do you mean by that? Like put together. So were you like eclectic? Like what was your... Ah, just all over the place. Like I would do this and over here and over here. Like I still do all of that, but I'm a bit more put together in how I do it. And you're owning it more too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's probably the key factor to what made it all work. Yeah, yeah, you got to own who you are. Yeah. Um, what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a woman of value? Uh, overthinking. Mm -hmm. Overthinking. Stinking overthinking. <laughs> exactly. Um, what's a mistake you made that taught you an important life lesson? 
Um, being aware of your energy when you're talking to people. You know, if you're an energetic woman, you can come off as aggressive. You can come off as, you know, too, you know, too intense, or you can come off with the basically something that is not nice to receive on the other end. So mm. I learned more about how to manage what you say in a way that's going to work for both you and the person that you're talking Interesting. to. Yeah, it's, um, that's really mature. <laughs> it took me a long time to know that, but it's like, you know, really seeing how other people see you and also that different people need different ways of communication. Yes. Yeah, that's actually really fun when you get over the whole daunting factor of it. Like when you can start to go like, all right, so what's the way I can make this conversation work? Or what does this person require from me yeah. in order to make this work? It's actually, it's actually really fun. Yeah, and, and, and once you know that, it's, um, it makes conversation so much easier. Yeah. And I have to say as a mom, because my kids are so different, um, knowing how to relate to each one very differently has helped mm. our relationship so much instead of having expectations that, yes. you know, why aren't they behaving this way? They should be right. <laughs> so yeah, once you start really tuning in to other people instead of making it about you, um, it changes everything. Yeah. All right. What's the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? Just start. No one's going to give you everything on the silver platter. You have to go out and you can graciously ask for it, but you also have to be willing to take it. Uh, receive. Yes. Awesome. The big and R word. That's like another hour's conversation. I know. I <laughs> love the receiving conversation too. I, I was watching an episode of Steve Harvey and he was talking to a woman who, uh, he was complimenting her and saying something really lovely. And she said, I received that, Steve. I received that. And I just loved it. I just thought, cool. you know, yeah, like how many times do we deflect a compliment yeah. and say, oh, no, you don't mean, oh, not me. Oh, this old thing, I bought it on discount. You know, it's like, yeah, I received, thank you. I received that. Mm. I actually, um, when we're on tour, sometimes I'll, we'll hire out a big house when we're in one location for a while. And one of my great friends that works on the project in Access called the Gentleman's Club was staying with us and he is truly a gentleman and he pushed my levels of control, receiving, <laughs> doing things in a certain way. Um, you know, and it was simple things like, Rebecca, can I make you a coffee? And from going, no, I'll get it to sure. That would be great. Awesome. And you know, like he would have a, like a little thing of, he would want to, you know, we were all sharing a car. So he would open the car door. He would just do so many little things that really, you know, it kind of pushed my limits a little bit and be like, all right, you know what? You actually just have to learn how to be a lady here and receive this because he's willing to offer this as a gift for you just for being his friend. Like this is how he would like to honor you as, as being his friend. So what do you, what kind of asshole are you being if you are saying, no, 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 it's fine. Like be gracious and let him handle it. And it's, it has, it's been a crash course in receiving a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's such an important life lesson because yeah. when we don't receive, we actually take away a gift that somebody's trying to give us Totally. and we don't usually see it that way. And I no. think men often define themselves as providers and it's can be very emasculating to say, no, I got this, I got this, you know, and you, so it's, it's on many levels, you did the, you yeah. did the right thing. <laughs> it's not like any of this, like, it didn't mean I know, I knew, I know not, blah, why can't I talk anymore? <laughs> no longer knew how to make a cup of coffee, or I could no longer have the function of opening my car door. Like, it didn't take away any of my power in order to receive that. It just was a wonderful gift. Yes, that's a great way to look at it. And finally, Rebecca... How would you like, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, uh, fun and like it made you feel like anything was possible. Mm. Well, you certainly have brought a lot of fun and possibility to this episode today. Uh, I love this conversation. I think you're very wise beyond your years. And I know that there's just limitless possibilities for you. Thank you. I've had way too much fun on here. <laughs> thank you for giving me an avenue for talking about the things that I love to talk about the most. This is 
truly been a pleasure. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.